Hey guys, so today I'm gonna to be testing the i5 8600K. I chose the i5 8600K because it's the oldest K series i5 that can still run Windows 11. So it's not considered a completely obsolete processor. I'm gonna run some stress tests and benchmarks. I'll record temps and I'll use the 13600K as a reference to see how much of an improvement they've made in five years. It's gonna be sick. <laughs> The i5 8600K came out back in quarter four of 2017. So five years before the 13600K came out. And if you compare them on paper, on the eighth gen, you're looking at six cores, six threads. It's interesting to know that the i5 still didn't have hyper threading back then. So Intel hyper threading allows more than one thread to run on each core. More threads means more work can be done in parallel. Here's a little uh, diagram of what that means. So on the 13600K, you have 14 cores, 20 threads. Since that processor has hyper threading, even though it has 14 physical cores, the processor can do work as if it had 20 cores. It has six virtual cores to allow work to be done in a parallel. So more work can be done at the same time which comes in handy if you're gonna be doing heavy CPU workloads like 3D rendering, video editing. Because of that technology, the 13600K has definitely improved when it comes to heavy CPU workloads. As far as power goes, the 8600K is rated at 95 watts of power versus 125 on the 13th gen. But on the 13600K, the turbo power is rated at 181 watts. I actually saw it get all the way up to 187 watts. So that's almost double the power of the 8600K. The the 13th gen is significantly faster with 5.1 gigahertz versus 4.3 gigahertz. The 8600K is only compatible with DDR4 RAM. On the 13th gen, you can do DDR4 or DDR5 RAM up to 3200 megahertz on DDR4 and 5600 megahertz on DDR5. Coffee Lake versus Raptor Lake. Once again, I think Raptor Lake is just way cooler. My last video, I said I really liked Raptors. Obviously, they use different socket types. Back then, Intel used LGA 1151. Now, the 13600K uses LGA 1700. If you look at the processors side by side, they're definitely different sizes. So that's one of the advantages that the 13600K has. So I'm gonna be using the same cooler. I'm gonna be using the NZXT Kraken X53. Same case, H5 Elite case. Same RAM, same power supply, same everything. The only difference is gonna be the motherboard and the processor. Let's go ahead, let's get started with, well actually I need to put it together. Let me put it together and then, yeah, let me just put it together really quick. It's gonna be fun. Yippee! I, uh, I was super excited when the 8600K came out because it was the first K-series i5 that had more than four cores. The 7600K before it only had four cores. This one had six, and I was like, dang, that's sick. Nowadays, four cores isn't really going to cut it if you want to game or do any kind of work, especially if you want to do heavy CPU workloads. Four cores isn't going to cut it. Yeah, I think I, ha I might have some pictures of my old build that I had the 8600K in. It had like a, it was like a 1060 with the 8600K. I was on a budget, okay, so it, doesn't, it didn't look that cool. The 4080 is too much GPU for this processor, but that's why I'm interested to see how much of a bottleneck I get. Just a quick example of of what a bottleneck is. This is how much power a 4080 can do, the, th the thick part of the bottle. That's how much girth, that's how much power a 4080 has. And the 8600K, the opening is how much power the 8600K can take at one time. So rather than having the same thickness where all the power can just go down and, and drop instantly, it's bottlenecked and it can only take so much. The amount of power is bottlenecked into whatever the processor can take, even though there's a lot more coming from the 4080. Hopefully that was a okay example. I'm sure there's diagrams out there. I was just doing a quick little uh, example using the girth of this bottle. You know, I had a 3090, but it wasn't a triple slot card. It was a dual slot card, but it was really long. And then I've seen the 3090 Founders Edition. I honestly didn't think much of it, but for some reason, the girth of this card always impresses me. It's just so girthy. First things first, I'm gonna run the Cinebench test. Since it doesn't have hyper threading, I don't expect it to do well at all. I'm interested to see what kind of heat I generate. Hey, Klaus, get the flip. I wonder if it'll heat up at all. It's not as power hungry as the 13600K. Let's go ahead and run it. Even though the 8600 is rated at 95 watt, the max wattage I saw during the test 
was only 66 watts. I don't know why it was so low. I would expect it to be closer to 95. The 13600K was pushing almost 190 watts, even though it said it was rated at 181 watts. And I got a score of 5,711. Honestly, that sucks, because <laughs> the 13600K got around 24,000. So 5,711, we can round that up to 6,000. 13600K scored four times better. Now it stayed relatively cool at 51 degrees Celsius as opposed to 80 degrees on the 13600K. Heat wasn't an issue, but you don't get anywhere near the performance. A matter of five years, the i5 has improved dramatically. More cores and the hyper-threading and the amount of power that the i5 can handle now make the 13600K score way better. Now the 8600K was designed mainly for gaming. So at the time you bought an i5 just to game. If you wanted to do any kind of workstation stuff, you would go with an i7 or a Xeon processor. And that year you could even go with the i9 processors that had just come out. I think it was the i9-7900X. If you wanted to do a lot of CPU heavy workloads, you could go with something like that. They were super expensive. They were LGA 2066. So the motherboards are pretty pricey. If you wanted better performance for workstation stuff, Intel offered that. The 8600K wasn't meant to score well in Cinebench. It was just meant for entry level gaming. It seems like now Intel is making the i5 a good all around CPU. So according to user benchmark, the 13600K is 34% faster in effective speed. When they did their test, their average score was about 63% faster. It's not a good multitasking processor and it doesn't really allow you to use it for heavy workloads. Running the user benchmark test. Let's see what scores we get and we'll compare it. <laughs> so what I ended up getting was 281 for gaming, 96 for desktop, and 233 for workstation. According to the test, it says the reason why it'll do well in workstation is because of the NVMe drive. Honestly, the processor is gonna hold you back when you're trying to do any heavy CPU workloads. So that's why sometimes I think this test is a little misleading. The 8600K is a good processor, but for workstation, it is not what it's designed to do. But yeah, those are the scores. So running the Firestrike Extreme test, let's see what it scores. I'll compare it to the 13600K. I got a score of 22,356. Combined FPS is almost 46 frames per second. Average compared to the 13600K, a little over 70 frames per second. So about a 54% increase in FPS when you go to the 13600K over the 8600K. There is a bottleneck, obviously. Obvious. So 54 degrees on the 8600K versus 62 degrees on 13600K. So overall, there's about a 36% increase in score when you compare the 8600K and the 13600K. But yeah, that's the Firestar Extreme test. So I'm gonna run the Furmark test. I'm gonna run it for 10 minutes. The 8600K is rated for 95 watts. In the Cinebench test that I ran, it was nowhere near 95 watts. I'm interested to see how much power I'm gonna be using during the Furmark test. The Furmark test will put 100% load on the CPU. I don't think heat's gonna be an issue. So let's see what happens. The 10 minutes are up. The max temp I saw was 53 degrees Celsius, which is honestly really good. On the 13600K, I was at 86 degrees Celsius. So that's what, 33 degrees hotter. But I never saw it get past 69 watts of power. Almost 190 watts of power versus 69 watts of power. You should expect a dramatic increase in performance. Now the 8600K, you can overclock and they are able to get it to use a little over 100 watts of power, which I'm sure will definitely help. But if you're gonna be pushing the 8600K to its limits like that and you're gonna be using it for workloads, it's probably not gonna last as long it stays relatively cool it's not heating up the room at all but your performance is kind of lackluster if you compare it to the modern processors so i'm running the shadow of the tomb raider benchmark right now i am running ultra everything at 1440p and 144 hertz let's see how it scores so my average fps was 122 frames per second the frames rendered was 18,576. On the 13600K, I got 233 FPS average, so almost double the FPS. Total frames rendered was 36,493. From what I've seen, the Shadow of the Tomb Raider relies heavily on the CPU, so that makes sense that there's such a big difference in FPS. Obviously, I already knew from the start the 4080 was overkill for this processor. You're combining new technology with five-year-old technology. Originally, it wasn't designed to run with this GPU. So I'm running the Cyberpunk benchmark test. I have ray tracing on. Let's see what my FPS is, and then we'll compare it to the 13600K. So with ray tracing on, I got about 65 frames per second average 
With ray tracing off, I got 95 frames per second average. With ray tracing on the 13600K, I got about 92 frames per second average, and then 108 frames per second average when ray tracing was off. Not as crazy of a jump as Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider, like I said, is more of a CPU dependent game. That's why you get double the frame rate on Tomb Raider versus on Cyberpunk. All right, let's move on to some gaming. I'll play probably Cyberpunk GTA 5. So let's go ahead and get her done. What exactly Whoa. is wrong? So after gaming, when I was playing GTA 5, at times I could get 144 frames per second, but the frame rate would definitely drop. It would drop all the way to 70 frames per second. When I was using the 4080 and the 3080, when I paired it with the 13600K, I wasn't getting less than 143 frames per second. It looks like the 8600K is severely bottlenecking it. At times I could get 144 frames per second if I stood completely still but honestly, it's it's not ideal. It looks like if you're wanting to play GTA 5 at 1440p, 144 hertz at max settings, it looks like the 8600K wasn't even sufficient to do that. And when I was playing Cyberpunk at ultra settings, I was getting between like 50 and 40 frames per second. Honestly, that's not very good. You'd want to be at least at 60 frames per second, at the least. Um, it did look choppy at times. Even though the 8600K was designed for gaming, the fact that it doesn't have hyper-threading, the fact that it only has six cores. I know back when it came out, six cores was more than enough. Nowadays, it looks like if you're wanting to play max settings, if you're wanting ray tracing on, not only do you have to have a good GPU, your CPU has to be exceptional. But I mean, what do you expect? It's a five-year-old CPU. It can still run Windows 11, so that's cool. It's, if you're looking to get better FPS, you probably want to play at 1080p. You'll get smoother gameplay. You also probably shouldn't pair with such a beefy GPU. 4080 is absolutely overkill for the 8600K. I would stick with mm, like a 3060 Ti, maybe a 3070 at the most. You'll start to get a crazy bottleneck if you go any higher than that. Honestly, even though the 8600K doesn't really stack up very well to today's i5, the 13600K, I still think it's a cool CPU. When I first bought it, I honestly felt really cool having an 8600K. Do I think an 8600K is worth it today? If you're trying to game in 1440p, no. The 8600K was good for its time. It can still do 1080p since it doesn't have hyper threading. It's not really any good unless you're just gaming. So don't expect it to do any heavy CPU workloads. It's gonna suck. I think the i3-12100F that I tested is better at handling those CPU heavy workloads. So one of the good things about the 8600K is that it's very power efficient. It's not very power hungry. The 13600K under full load was using almost 190 watts. The 12900K that I have usually pushes 230, 240 watts. So if you live in a warmer area and you don't want to add a heater to your room, the 8600K is the perfect processor for that. I think the 8600K has a special place in my heart because that was like the first over thousand dollar build that I actually built. You know, growing up in middle school, I remember always wanting to build computers. I just never really saved up the money or had the money to uh, build something. I think at the time I was looking at like a NVIDIA 9600 GT. My first GP was a uh, NVIDIA 7950 GT, I think that's what it was. Paired it with like, it was my parents' old Dell, what was it, a Dell Dimension something? I don't remember it. Created the RAM from two to four. It had an 80 gig hard drive and it had a Pentium 4, where it was a single core processor. It wasn't really mine, it was my parents' office computer, but it was the first computer that I upgraded. And then after that, I really wanted one of those AMD Phenom processors. They were like triple core processors. I thought that that was crazy. After that, I wanted like an FX. 8350. I was like, this is all you need. I don't know why I would need any more than this. I never really got that. I just would buy laptops for school, stuff like that. And it wasn't until I started working at Geek Squad and I'm like, oh gosh, I, I gotta, I just gotta build a computer. Yeah, the 8600K was the one that I chose and I'm like, I'm never gonna need to upgrade this. Five years later, I'm like, hey, yeah, this CPU is kind of like the computer you leave by your TV if you want to have a computer hooked up to your TV. It's not something that you would use or it's a good office computer, Fortnite computer. I wouldn't let 
anyone play Fortnite in my house, but yeah. So I guess that's why the 8600K has a special place in my heart because it was the first over thousand dollar build that I had that was like, man, I have some power. The 8600K doesn't stack up very well to 13600K or the 12600K that I've tested. I think its biggest downfall is the lack of hyper threading. If it could use virtual course to help it during gaming, especially like open world games like GTA 5 or Tomb Raider, which both games tend to rely on the CPU a lot. 12th gen i3s are already better than the 8600K. I think it's, it's fun to pull a lot older technology compared to the new stuff. I think it's just a fun way to see how technology has changed and it does bring back to the good old days when nothing mattered. Next thing I wanna try, I have an SLI bridge. I know SLI is dead, or is it? I just wanna mess around with it. I wanna see what the heck I can do with it. That's it. I don't know if I have anything else to say about the 8600K. Other than that, it still has a special place in my heart. Peace.